Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So um, today, uh, those of us that can have been sitting together and cultivating and expressing the spirit of a particular kind of deep wisdom that we hope to embody in our zazen and in our ordinary lives. So. Uh, this is the spirit of clear seeing represented um, in many Buddhist traditions, including our own by Manjushri, who is the Bodhisattva of wisdom. Can you all hear me okay? Good. Um, so I wanna talk about Manjushri today and um, the importance of wisdom in our tradition. And because thanks to the great generosity of one of our members, Eric Locker, we now have a beautiful Manjushri statue on our altar. See him right up there. Um, that traveled all the way from Japan to be with us. So, um, so after my talk, we're going to be having a brief ceremony called the eye-opening ceremony. And in that ceremony, one invites and honors the spirit expressed in a particular statue. So you um, kind of wake up the mojo. <laughs> um, so traditionally in a Soto Zen temple, monastery, Manjushri is a central figure in the Zendo. And Buddha is a central figure in the room that's used for ceremonies, services, and rituals. But since in our temple, we just have one room for everything, um, uh, Buddha sits is central and Manjushri sits with the Buddha, either on the side or as we've done in front. They're kind of buddies companions. There's often a third one, but um, today we're going to focus on Manjushri. So just to recap what a Bodhisattva is, uh, even if you're familiar with this, it's always good to remember. A Bodhisattva is a being that is dedicated to awakening for the benefit of all beings. And there's kind of three general ways that bodhisattvas are regarded. The, the first is us, is a person who takes up a path, uh, takes up the path of bodhisattva with an aspiration to benefit all beings. So not just us, but anyone who takes up that path, whatever, however it is. And we often extend the meaning to those who inspire us and um, care for us, whether they practice Buddhism or not. So for example, someone like, oh, I was just thinking about um, methodology actually, but um, um, Sojourner Truth, mm -hmm. um, Gandhi, um, people who we look at them and we go, wow, that that's courage, that's compassion, that's dedication, that's, or it might be someone um, close to home, like a grandparent or the, um, I always think when I used to live in San Francisco, I always thought, wow, the Bodhisattva bus driver, you know, what would it be like to greet each person with complete dignity and respect and kindness. Wouldn't that change the world? So 
we can think of it in that way. Also, we can think of it as a representation of a dimension of our being. For example, the capacity to see clearly, to live with kindness and compassion, to bring energy and vitality to our lives. These are dimensions of who we are, right? We can think of them kind of as inner dimensions. And the third is as an entity or an exemplar of a particular quality. For example, wisdom, compassion, dedicated practice, and that one venerates and appeals to. So this last is perhaps not so easy for some of us to understand in this secularized culture. Um, it's, but it's quite standard in um, Asian cultures, uh, even today. And um, the chants we do here uh, in the morning include a recognition and a veneration of these exemplars. For example, uh, the verse of the Universal Gateway, which is part of the Lotus Sutra that we chant, we call on Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, to aid us and all beings in times of suffering, to transform this suffering world into a place of peace even for this moment. If we dismiss this dimension of what a bodhisattva is, we, we miss a lot of the richness and power. Have you ever called out? Have you ever felt alone or grieving or confused and felt your own desire to call out for help? I have. So who do we call out to? I don't know exactly, but we can identify these different qualities that and, and pay attention to them in exa exemplars. For example, the Bodhisattva of Compassion. May the Bodhisattva of Compassion bring kindness. May the Bodhisattva of Wisdom bring clear seeing. May the Bodhisattva of vigorous practice, bring great activity to this world right now. So you can regard the bodhisattvas in any way you like. There's no right way to do this. Um, whatever way works for you, or you can just forget about it. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the nice things about our tradition. You don't have to sign on the dotted line for anything. You just do what works for you and you deepen into your own life. So the key thing to remember is that we, who we are is not separate from all these qualities, from these bodhisattvas. Wisdom, compassion, dedicated practice, as well as many other important qualities are alive in us, in our lives, and in others, and in the world. The teachings of Zen, our teachings, point repeatedly to the fact that who we are is not limited by our dualistic notions. Instead, we are encouraged to be curious, ask questions, often inconvenient questions about the world and ourselves and welcome the ways that we are led to expand our vision, our experience and our lives with others. So there's no one way to regard these, no, there's no one way to occur, um, encounter these. We're just considering one possibility today. What we know is that as we practice with these dimensions, um, we fold them into our reality and we are folded into their reality. And um, this expands us, deepens us, creates in us capacities to fully engage with the world. In a way, um, the word bodhisattva is more a verb than a noun. It's a way of being. These are ways of being in the world. 
So then we can say, okay, we've got a little bit of sense of what Bodhisattva is. Who's Manjushri? In particular, what do they have to do with our lives? So I first want to address uh, the use of the pronoun he. So it's problematic, but it is what is usually used. So respecting the traditional usage, I will use he, but I'll also mix it up. <laughs> and I invite you to do the same because there's no gender identification with any of these qualities, you know? So <clears throat> none of them are gendered. Doesn't it kind of make you nuts when people like say, oh, the girls are kind or the boys are tough. Really? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. So Manjushri is uh, the Bodhisattva of Prajna, insight, deep, deep, deep insight. Insight into the true nature of things, including ourselves. With this seeing, we come to know that all aspects of existence are fundamentally and completely intertwined. All the way through, nothing left out of the web of existence. Seeing ourselves in all reality in this way frees us from the bondage of delusion, separation, suffering of isolation and estrangement. This wisdom is not something we acquire. It is present all along. It is an aspect of the reality of who we are. So our aim is not to get somewhere to acquire something. It's just to settle in and be transformed by what is already present. We can rely on this wisdom, whether we can see it at any given time or not. It is present. When we can see in this way, we recognize that allowing the understanding of ourselves and others and the world to shift, letting go of our cherished notions, it's not a loss. It can feel like a loss, but it's not a loss. It's a liberation. And it is the root and companion of compassion and skillful means, skillful actions. So I just want to give you a little bit of history about Manjushri, okay? Um, Manjushri is not a part of the early Buddhist teachings, although in some traditions, he is said to have followed and assisted the historical Buddha as a disciple and was uniquely gifted with intelligence, determination, and this led to his deep insight. They first appear in Mahayana Sutras, in particular the Lotus Sutra, the Flower Ornament Sutra, Vimalakirti Sutra, and primarily associated with the Prajnaparamita Sutras. So this is a large collection of sutras, um, and it includes the Heart Sutra that we chant here, okay? So um, they are portrayed in many ways as posing questions to the Buddha to clarify teachings for everyone present. So when, when Jushri can sometimes be the, the squeaky wheel that says, but what about, but how about, but tell us more, you know, kind of an intermediary person in a sense, eliciting from the Buddha clear language that will help us. So he poses questions to the Buddha and uses language in a way that tweaks us, upsets our preconceived notions. So um, Manjushri came to prominence in India in the fourth century, took a central place in the Buddhist uh, pantheon in the fifth or sixth century and, and ended up coming to Japan in about the eighth century. So. So we're talking about a figure who has a long history in our tradition. And I think this makes sense because clear seeing is essential to our path, right? We want to be able to see clearly, dispel delusion, confusion. 
So uh, because of her identification with wisdom, Prajna, Manjushri is associated with Prajna Paramita. And Prajna Paramita is a female entity called the radiant mother of all Buddhas, said to dispel all darkness and delusion, radiate wisdom, and bestow wisdom on all who venerate her. So there's some wonderful chants and praise for Prajnaparamita. <clears throat> so Manjushri and Prajnaparamita are deeply associated. Manjushri's name gives us a sense of the quality of the wisdom and the path that we're talking about here. Manju in Sanskrit, in Sanskrit has been translated as kind, gentle, sweet, and melodious. And Sri is glory, power, merit, nobility, brilliance, and auspiciousness. So Manjushri is translated as gentle glory, wonderfully auspicious, sweetly glorious, noble gentle one, and in the Tibetan tradition, gentle friend. Other names are Lord of Speech, Sweet Sounding One, Melodious Voiced One, and one with gentle speech that has a sweetness that is pure stainless clear light. In, in Japan, he's known as Manju, um, which has the same meaning. Unfortunately, there was a nuclear power plant named Manju in Japan. So I wanna I wanna focus here on the uh, emphasis on gentleness and sweetness in the name. This is really important. Um, wisdom is often associated with kind of you know like harsh or demanding or unfeeling. Did have you guys ever associated it with that kind of more cold? No. Oh boy. Huh. I have yeah. Been. So this name emphasizes the gentleness and the nurturance of this wisdom. Even when Manjushri is portrayed uh, as wielding a flaming sword, the sword is wielded with care. So, um, when we're sitting together today or right now, or as you go along, uh, we can return to this wisdom anytime, anywhere, under any circumstance, no matter what. And we can find strength, support and clarity in it. Um, so I wanna say a few words about the statues of Manjushri. So there's many ways that Manjushri has been portrayed and each of them tells us something about the quality of prajna, deep insight. In most representations, Manjushri has a sword in one hand and a book or a scroll in the other. The sword in Sanskrit is called, I don't speak Sanskrit. I mean, who, I don't know how to pronounce this, but I think it's Kagda, Kagda. And it's a symbol of discriminating wisdom and cuts through delusions, cuts through attachments, cuts through aversions and all the nuttiness we can come up with in our lives. Everything that keeps us bound to samsara and our dualist, dualistic vision. It frees us from entanglements the snares of ignorance, doubt. Sometimes it can be like a machete and sometimes it can be like, you know, those little crane scissors that are used in sewing? Like just snip, 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 snip. 
when the sword is flaming, it's expressing light, power, and clarity of insight. And sometimes uh, it's raised and sometimes it's resting at Manjushri's side. Usually when we think of cutting, we think of cutting into two parts, right? When you cut something, you cut into two parts. But Manjushri sort of said to cut into one. Manjushri cuts into one. Um, because Manjushri sword does not create further divisions. Instead, Manjushri sword cuts in cuts us into wholeness, into connection, into a way of understanding our life that is vital and mutual. We see and understand that each and every existence, including ourselves, is completely connected, completely interwoven. And in that, with that clear seeing, compassion becomes obvious. Clear activity becomes obvious. So along with the sword, <laughs> Manjushri carries a scroll or a text. Um, these are most often associated with the Prajnaparni Paramitra literature of texts. But we can understand it as um, any treasury of wisdom literature. And Manjushri is a part of much of that wisdom literature, as I said. So other attributes of Manjushri, um, he can hold a lotus flower, a jewel, a small teaching scepter. Most usually in, in Nepalese and Tibetan Manjushri, uh, depictions is the sword, but in East Asian traditions, the sword is often absent. Manjushri is often seated on a lion, usually understood to represent energy, courage, power, strength, valor, and stateliness. But sometimes the lion is associated with the wildness of our minds that Manjushri tames. The seat on which Shakyamuni Buddha sits is often called the lion throne. And Buddha's utterances are often described as the lion's roar. In Japan, um, there are these guardian lions, you've probably seen them, and they uh, are thought to repel evil. So there's this sense of the lion as both a source and a protector. In the Tibetan tradition, Manjushri is portrayed as a young person, indicating the beginning of wisdom and the dedication to, and energy to carry through on the path, right? So Manjushri, as I said, sits in the center of the Zen meditation halls. And the idea is it encourages he or she or they encourage deep introspection, awakening insight, penetrating into the essence and cutting off distractions and delusions. So there's a spirit that we welcome into this place. Some of the modern images of Manjushri on altars depict him as um, a monk with a shaved head and no scroll or sword sitting with great steadiness on the lion. No decoration, no ornaments, no flaming swords, no nothing. In a sense, um, this image incorporates the sword and the scroll into the body of this, what's called the sacred monk, Shozo, um, as an exemplar for us for all practitioners. So our statue is like that. A monk sitting atop a lion and we see no sword or book visible. But you know, I was like, oh, you know, isn't there a sword there? So you can take a look at it. But I was looking at it and um, I thought I saw the, you know, there's the tail and the mane of the lion are swirling. And I thought I saw 
a swirl that looked like a sword in the tail. So I thought, um, well, um, maybe the lion's taking care of the sword. When we when we follow this, when we embody this, we're settling into our deepest intention, right? We want to see clearly. We're not chasing after anything or grasping anything. We're recognizing that this wisdom is central to our being and we can trust it. We can trust our own inner wisdom. And it's no different than Manjushri's wisdom. We sit on our cushion and we go about our lives knowing that this is available to us. Manjushri's wisdom. So the lion supports and carries Manjushri. And if we take this into our minds and hearts, we open to the wisdom that is always present. We see through delusion, separation, ranking, judgment, anger, isolation, all the things that harm us. We come to know a vastness of our being. And wisdom takes deeper root in our lives. So there's a lot more I could say about Manjushri and um, there's lots of tales and koans, some of them really wild. Um, so if you're interested, you might poke around a little bit on the internet or in a good book and um, ask questions. Who's Manjushri? Ask questions of yourself. Ask questions of the literature. But today we're we're going to welcome Manjushri into our zendo. Not that Manjushri was, has been absent from here. You set up a you sit down. Manjushri is right there. We're sitting on the lion's throne, right? Um, but we're going to do the a short ceremony called the opening eye, and I thought I would just say a few words about that before we go into question and answer. Um, so we'll start with three bows, offering incense and three bows. And then uh, the, there'll be a statement, short statement about Manjushri and about Eric's gift to us, um, expression of gratitude. And then we will ritually open the eye. So Shinshu's going to do Manjushri's eye. And then we thought we would open the lion's eyes as well, because why should the lion not have? their eyes opened. Then we'll do a chant of the Heart Sutra and um, some closing words and we'll chant the names of the Buddhas and then a final dedication in three vows. So um, I hope you can stay for that if you can um, to welcome Manjushri statue here. Thank you very much. Yeah.